So where do we go from here? I think it's going to be a pretty flat year for the, if we're talking about GDP. Uh, real GDP, I think this year is going to be close to flat. The Fed laid its cards on the table. It told us in its last uh, set of projections, it's expecting real GDP to be one, plus 1.4% this year. Historically, half the time when you have 1.4% growth in a given year, you had a recession. My view is not actually that much different than, than the Fed uh, in terms of where the economy is going. But just consider what the Fed's telling you about the economy, plus 1.4% that's uh, substantially weaker than plus 3% last year. David Rosenberg, founder and president of Rosenberg Research. It is so great to welcome you to the show. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me, Dave. It's uh, an honor to be here with you. Thanks for inviting me on. Well, it's an honor to have you and I've wanted to have you on for a long time now. And I want to start where I always start with my guest, Dave, and that is to get their big picture macro view of the economy. And one of the things about this show is you can take all the time you need to set the table, if you will, when it comes to the macro picture. Well, I'd have to say that the macro picture is uh, perplexing uh, and confusing uh, and uh, confounding uh, all simultaneously. So I know that um, the vast majority of economists uh, by now have thrown in uh, the recession towel because uh, the recession hasn't uh, happened yet. And it's almost uh, as if me sitting in my perch uh, in Toronto saying, well, it didn't snow up here in Canada in December, so therefore we'll just call winter off. So uh, I am a firm believer uh, in the business cycle. I don't believe the business cycle has been repealed. And I do believe that interest rates matter, but they percolate through the economy with long lags uh, and those lags vary from cycle to cycle. I almost feel like uh, I'm back in 2007 when everybody was asking, where's this recession already? Uh, and uh, it took about a, a good year or more for that call to unfold. People remember me as being right. Um, but in real time, I was viewed as, if not wrong, then at least crazy early. Uh, and so, and what happened back then was that, you know, the Fed's rate hikes, remember they took the funds rate from 1% up to five and a quarter. And, and it took a long time for the lags to kick in um, because right up until the end, and the end was December 2007, that's when the recession began. The recession that nobody saw back then well, it was because um, households were still deriving considerable cash flow. Uh, from extracting uh, equity from their homes. So we still had, you know, the acronym back then uh, was uh, MU, Mortgage Equity Withdrawal, MEW, and Cash Flow Refinancings. But, you know, that lasted as long as it could. And then in December of 07, unbeknownst to many, uh, the NBR recession actually began. And this time around, you know, the lags have been longer, uh, primarily because last year, what did we see that uh, clogged up the pipeline from what the, what the Fed had done? Uh, was the final drawdown of all those um, pandemic era savings from the massive fiscal stimulus from a couple of years ago. Uh, I certainly didn't expect that every last penny was going to get spent, but we have, I think, a more narcissistic uh, consumer sector today than we had in the past. You know, historically, uh, the evidence shows that when consumers are confronted with a, a stimulus check from the generosity of Uncle Sam, they spend half and they save half. Um, but because we're so consumed with uh, the COVID experience and uh, YOLO, I mean, YOLO, you only live once. YOLO to Main Street is what FOMO is to Wall Street. Um, so I didn't anticipate that we we're going to finish last year with a savings rate of 3.7%. You know, the historical average for the savings rate is 9%. Pre-COVID was over 7%, we're 3.7%. Uh, and on top of that, we had a... Um, a huge increase in uh, credit card balances, a lot of credit card borrowing, keeping the consumer alive. Uh, and that was part of it as well. And then we had uh, the gargantuan fiscal stimulus, um, you know, very unusual uh, in a period of full employment. I mean, 3.7% unemployment rate. And here we have, um, you know, the Biden team, I mean, in conjunction with Congress, really juicing the system last year. I mean, how often do we have full employment and the fiscal deficit balloons 25% uh, to $1.8 So actually, you know, when you run the numbers, you'll see that the fiscal stimulus alone, like put away the, the consumer borrowing and the drawdown of excess savings, just the stimulus last year 
and you weigh in all the multiplier impacts, like the direct impact of all the spending and these tax subsidies uh, to make America the great uh, global chip producer once again. Uh, and uh, it means that when you count in all the direct and indirect effects, uh, fiscal stimulus uh, accounted for two thirds of the growth in the economy. If we define the economy as real GDP, which is one part of the economy, which is spending, but that's what everybody, including the Fed, focuses on, uh, that really strip bare uh, from fiscal to underlying private sector economic activity was closer to 1% growth than 3% growth. Uh, so that's really trying to, you know, it's not trying to uh, hide away from a bad call as much as try to explain, you know, uh, why did this recession not happen last year? And there were an array of what I refer to as non-recurring factors at play. Uh, the, the drawdown in savings, uh, that seems to have played its course. Uh, the fiscal stimulus, uh, the incremental impact on the economy uh, is not going to be nearly what it was last year in compared to what it's going to be this year. Uh, and so against that backdrop, and of course, you're seeing the, the banks have tightened up dramatically uh, on uh, their extension of credit cards. Uh, so a lot of these things last year that uh, clogged up the recession call and uh, made it um, a tad too early, uh, those factors that I call non-recurring factors that supported the economy uh, are not going to be here this year. So uh, I'm one of the few that have not thrown into the recession towel. Uh, I clearly happening later rather than sooner. Uh, but I do think that uh, the lags uh, have yet to fully percolate their way through the economy. So I'm still in the recession camp. Uh, it's a matter really of when it's going to start this year. Uh, you know, timing is uh, both an art and a science, but uh, it's very difficult to do. You know, as uh, Yogi Berra famously said, uh, making predictions uh, is extremely difficult, especially when, it's, when it pertains about the future. So, uh, but I'm not, uh, I've not given up. Uh, I'm very bullish still uh, on the bond market. I think that uh, you can argue that uh, underlying inflation is taking its time to go down to the levels that will make the Fed comfortable. But I do think we're going to get there. I think that monetary policy right now is excessively um, restrictive. So I do think that interest rates are going to come down. The yield curve is going to steepen. I think that this year bond returns, especially out the treasury curve, are going to produce equity-like returns. Um, so um, bullish on bonds relative to stocks. I'm not backing away from that call. And I think that the recession that everybody uh, was frustrated who was calling for it that are thrown in the towel uh, are going to be the ones that are going to use that towel to wipe the uh, egg off their face between now and the end of the year. I think the recessionary forces are going to be building more than what's priced into uh, financial assets or the economic consensus. Yeah, what a great frame up to the discussion. Let me ask you this too, because you're right. Last year, it was like 85% of economists and analysts. The baseline was that we'd see a recession. Didn't transpire. You point out a lot of the factors that were clogging that up. But as someone who was um, more of a lone voice going back to 2007, you said like people thought you were crazy on the trading floor. Does it give you more conviction um, in the recession call when you kind of see everyone kind of like throw in the towel because you've kind of been there before as the lone voice? Well, I don't, uh, well, you know, it wasn't just 2007, by the way, Julie was also, you know, in 2000, same thing, you know, where's this recession already? And of course it began in March of 2001. The consensus didn't start calling for the recession until after 9-11. Uh, I mean, the recession at that point, uh, you know, was about eight months old. And so, you know, uh, I, I mean, I follow the consensus. I know what my competitors are saying, uh, I, and I respect them. Uh, and uh, you have to know, uh, you know, where they're positioned. Does it influence my call? Um, no. What influences my call uh, are the leading indicators that I pay attention to, the understanding of how economic and financial history work, the symbiotic relationship between the financial markets and the real economy, and understanding uh, that these lags can be very long. So yeah, in answer to your question, it does feel like 2007. I think the only other person by the end of 07 that was still calling for recession as far as Wall Street economic houses were concerned uh, was Dick Berner, who at that point was chief economist to Morgan Stanley. Uh, and I was focused on the housing market. He thought we we're going to have a capital goods recession. Uh, and it took time to play out. But no, I, don't, I don't let the consensus influence my decision. Uh, I just look at it. I guess you can look at it as a contrary indicator when everybody is in the same camp on the same view. 
uh, you know that um, something else is probably going to happen. Um, so does it embolden my view? I guess in some sense you could say that it does because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a contrary thinker. Uh, but it doesn't really influence, uh, you know, if I have to throw, if I have to throw in the towel, uh, on my view, and I'm not going to say that's not going to happen. There's no such thing as a sure thing in this business. And I don't believe in 0% or hundred percent, uh, on anything. Uh, however, if I end up throwing in the towel, I'd probably be the last one who will do that. It won't be because of where the consensus is. It'll be because the bottom line is that, uh, the data are driving me, uh, to that conclusion. And then I will have to write a whole report which will be a gigantic mea culpa, where I'll have to uh, probably explain that, uh, you know, that actually we are in some sort of new era. Uh, and uh, I'll try and think that through. Uh, for the time being, I'm not there. But it won't be the consensus that pushes me there. It'll be the uh, the incoming data and not the coincident and lagging indicators as much as the forward-looking ones. So, Dave, when you when you see um, a lot of the commentary out there, um, when folks talk about like the resilience of the U.S. economy, and you highlighted a bunch of this in, in the top of the conversation, but what do you think folks are getting the most wrong? I imagine like when you look under the hood, you'll see things that maybe they don't look so resilient after all. Well, you know, that's what I said at the beginning, which is that uh, we have bifurcation everywhere. Uh, I mean, you, you can argue, for example, in the stock market that um, things are starting to broaden out a little bit, but, you know, uh, really just a little bit. Uh, and uh, it's still a stock market that's been dominated by these mega cap growth stocks that in actuality being, you know, long duration equities um, don't really respond much to what's happening with the business cycle. Um, but you've had that bifurcation, you know, between the large caps, the small caps, the uh, cap weighted S and P and uh, the equal weighted S and P, uh, all these bifurcations. But it's also been in the real side data as well. But you see, the issue is this: it's because everybody focuses on um, the, uh, you know, the, the the high frequency, shall we say, um, popular statistics, uh, and the Fed does as well. So let's let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. For example, we we bow down to the Holy Grail. Of GDP, and GDP is all about spending, uh, consumer spending, business spending, uh, residential construction, commercial construction, inventory investment, government spending. That's spending uh, in the national accounts. So, in real terms, adjusted for inflation, the GDP, which everybody focuses on to create their judgment on how the economy is doing, well, that was up three percent last year. But there's also the income accounts, right? There's real gross domestic income. Uh, and that's basically wages and profits and rents and interest. And in real terms, that appears to have been flat as a pancake last year. In fact, the divergence between the income accounts and the spending accounts has never been this wide. Uh, and when you look at profits, we were talking about, well, look look what profits are doing. They're beating estimates, but adjusted for inflation. And of course, the business cycle, when the NBER is making its decision to call for the recession or for the expansion, it's looking at real inflation-adjusted variables, uh, not nominal variables, real profits. Real profits are actually in decline. So real GDP up 3%, real GDI is flat, and then you have the product accounts. Because there's three different accounts. There's spending, there's income. What did production do last year? What did production do? Like GDI in real terms, flat, flat, flat production, flat real income, but plus 3% gross domestic product, which is spending. So what it tells me is that, you know, the, the gap between these different parts of the economy, because there's different ways you can measure economic activity, is because of the leverage. You see, production is not leveraged, Julia, and incomes are not leveraged, but you see spending is leveraged. So what really influenced the gap between these measures is the fact that you had tremendous growth in credit card usage, uh, and you had uh, an epic drawdown in personal savings to fund consumption. Uh, And that showed up in in the spending data. So that's why, you know, you got this false glow. Uh, and so am I supposed to change my view when I see these glaring anomalies within the national accounts? The answer is no. There's no reason for me to. I don't bow down to the Holy Grail 
of one measure of the national accounts. Now, especially as I said earlier, that a lot of that oomph and verve uh, and panache that we saw in the GDP data, a lot of that, as I said before, I view that as as non-recurring items. Uh, if I was like a, an equity analyst looking at a company, you have to identify asterisks. What are the recurring and non-recurring items? So a little skeptical that um, that the GDP growth uh, is going to be sustained. That much is for sure. And then you look at the employment side. So, you know, you get non-farm payrolls, non-farm payrolls uh, on a year-over-year basis running at 1.9% year-over-year. That's pretty darn good. Uh, but the household survey is running close to flat. Once again, a historical divergence between these two very powerful sources of information when it comes to the labor market. But of course, everybody, once again, worships the non-farm payroll report. Well, by the way, so does the Fed. But the household survey actually does a much better job at turning points in the cycle in both directions. And household employment is virtually flattened, not just that, but we are seeing a discernible shift from full-time jobs to part-time jobs. In fact, the United States, for all the talk of the vibrant jobs market, how is it that there has not been one full-time job created in the United States since last February? Not one. And this is corroborated within the payroll number. So people say to me, well, notwithstanding what you're saying, Dave, you know, the, the payroll survey has a larger sample than the household survey. It's the one that the Fed focuses on. And I get all that. But here's what I'm going to say. If you actually believe in the veracity of the non-farm payroll report and that 353,000 alleged surge we had in January, well, what did the work week do? The work week was down 0.6% month over month, that's over a negative 7% annual rate in the work week. And so when you're taking a look at the labor market holistically, you can't just look at the bodies. You have to take a look at, you know, how much time are they spending at work? So that's what's, uh, again, a massive divergence between employment and between hours. So you can argue that companies are adding more people to their staff loads, but yet they're cutting everybody's work week. And, and so when you look at the two together, uh, there's been no growth in total labor input into the economy since November. The index of aggregate hours, the index of aggregate hours work is a great indicator of recession, and it usually peaks two months before the NBER defined recession. Well, it peaked in November. So these are the things I'm looking for, you know, And but I have to say that I understand there is a lot of um, puzzling things going on, a lot of sh missing pieces, shifting pieces, uh, things that just cause your head to spin. I said the the divergence of the national accounts, but also the divergence between the household and the payroll survey, and then within the payroll survey, massive divergence between employment and hours, and within the household survey, massive divergence between full-time and part-time employment. So I ask you the question, what's an economist supposed to do? Yeah. You know, I love I this is what I love about this show is I get to learn from folks like yourself and you're helping all of us learn these things. And when you talk about these divergences, like you said, the, the Holy Grail, a lot of folks focus on the GDP or they focus on the NFP. What? Why do you think there is so much focus there? Because it sounds to me like when you're unpacking this, you know, GDI, for example, or household surveys, they're kind of flashing warning signs before we go into a recession. Why Why do you think there isn't more of a focus there? Well, look, I think that um, GDP comes out on a timely basis. The GDI is lagged and um, it has always been a market mover. And uh, when the Fed is talking to you about economic activity, they're really referring to uh, the GDP. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the employment surveys, uh, you know, there's no doubt that the establishment or payroll survey has a uh, larger sample size, tends to be less noisy. And that, again, is the one that, um, you know, that uh, that the markets pay attention to, uh, because if the roles were reversed, if the household survey, if the payroll survey had shown what the household survey did and household employment was negative in January, I think treasuries would have rallied. They wouldn't have sold off. Um, but look, uh, I, I think they have to take, as I said before, a very holistic view. I'm not saying to ignore the payroll survey. I'm saying we have to take a look at it in conjunction with all the other information that we're seeing. 
Uh, it was ADP consistent with uh, non-farm payrolls? No. Well, the JOLT survey, that consistent? Or the challenger, challenger hirings, challenger hirings in January uh, were the lowest for any January in history. Um, you're starting to see claims back up. Uh, the backlog of continuing claims uh, has been rising inexorably over the course of the past several months. There, there are cracks that are emerging. Uh, and it hasn't shown up yet in non-farm payrolls. But the one thing I would just say is, once again, uh, it could well be that companies are, you know, the, the, the just the miserable memory of uh, losing their staff during COVID and the shutdowns. Uh, and then when things reopened, they couldn't find them. And we had this, call it two-year period of this epic mismatch, couldn't find your employees again yet to really seriously run up your wage bill to attract them back in. And so I do actually respect the view that if there's one thing that's changed because of COVID uh, has been the uh, changes taking place in the corporate sector in terms of their employment practices. So they're not firing anybody. If you believe the payroll numbers, they're actually adding to their staff loads, um, but they're cutting their hours. And uh, this is something that's, uh, that is actually very interesting. Uh, you know, usually when you go into recession, hours are being cut and employment is going down. This time around, uh, employment's still going up in the payroll survey, but the hours are going down. But you see, it's got to a point where the lines have uh, intersected in a way where the decline in hours worked is starting to swamp the increase in employment. And I'll give you an example. If you take a look at the person hour equivalent impact from cutting the work week 0.6%, which is huge, um, and then you even layer on the, uh, the headline number, uh, it's as if the economy lost 500,000 jobs in January. That's how powerful the decline on the work week was. So, um, I guess that's the point I'm making. Divergences everywhere. Uh, looking at the labor market, when I'm taking a look at it in a very complete framework, it is starting to shrink, even though it's not showing up in headline on farm payroll. So I come back to the question like, you know, so why would I throw in the recession towel just because everybody else has or just because the S&P has hit a new nominal high um, to a large extent because of these uh, mega cap stocks, be that as it may. The economy, I think, when you look at it in totality, is is weaker than the narrative suggests. And uh, I'm sticking with that view. Yeah. And as you put it earlier, like it's like a false glow. And I imagine a bunch of that has to do with um, the fiscal stimulus, maybe propping some of that up in as a non-recurring item. Yeah, that was a big factor, uh, accounting for two-thirds of the growth when you count on the multiplier impact. So it was really a 1% economy. But then, you know, you go into 2024. And as you said, uh, fiscal, is it recurring? No, it's not. Uh, and in fact, um, it looks as though fiscal policy on net will be a modest drag this year, not a net contribution to GDP growth. So the savings rate at 3.7% is rock bottom. Are we going to get a drawdown on the savings rate to support consumption? I highly doubt it. You are starting to see strains, um, you know, as we saw in the wake of the CPI data, uh, that in real terms, average weekly earnings uh, were negative 0.3. You see, that's, you see, again, that's something that I kept on asking my old client base because they're told by my competitors how great the labor market is. And I, I said, well, you know, before I got the CPI numbers, I said, well, the employment number was so great in January, 353,000 non-farm payroll, so great that in nominal terms, average weekly earnings, which is the proxy for work-based income, was unchanged. It was flat. And then you get hit with the 0.3 CPI. And so that means average weekly earnings in real terms was negative 0.3. And actually, it's now declining on a year-over-year -year basis. Um, and so how is that going to support consumption going forward? I, I'm not expecting that we're going to be seeing, now, now that I'm looking at the banks are cutting back on credit extension and they're tightening the lending standards, I don't expect we're going to get another boom in credit cards. Now, maybe I'm completely out to lunch, and now that the excess savings has been drawn down, and now that everybody is uh, not going to be able to borrow more on their credit cards like they did last year, 
So maybe the the next part of the Energizer Bunny story is the is the buy now pay later, uh, you know, situation which seems to be like spiraling out of control. I mean, how do you basically tell people that consumers in such great shape? Oh, 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 right. Household balance sheets are in great shape. I hear that all the time. Household balance sheets are just in great shape. And of course, what these people look at, these other economists, is they look at the household debt to income ratio and compare it to 06 and 07, which was the most gargantuan credit bubble of all time. So if you want to compare yourself to 07, knock yourself out. But actually, household debt to income is higher than any other cycle peak before 07. But if that's what you want to measure the yardstick, uh, you know, go for it. Um, how does it, how do you get a strong household balance sheet when we're already seeing in real time two major aspects of this? And now it's not mortgages. It's not the mortgage bubble this time. Lightning doesn't strike twice. Autos and credit cards and auto loan and credit card delinquency rates are all the way back to where they were in 2011 when the unemployment rate was over 8%. So we have to ask ourselves the question. I mean, this is the question that I pose. We got the unemployment rate at 3.7% and we got delinquency rates on autos and cons- and credit cards to levels that were consistent with an unemployment rate of 8%. So where do these go? Where do these metrics go if unemployment rate starts to go up? And then what's the knock-on effects on bank lending, low loss reserves. I mean, we're not even talking yet about commercial real estate or multifamily, which is, they're both major albatrosses uh, on the financial system going forward. Just talking about the consumer here. So I don't expect that we're going to have another year of a credit card boom, point one. I don't think we're going to have another year where there's going to be excess savings drawn down since that's already happened. And uh, point number three is we're not going to have another year of a fiscal boost. So where do we go from here? I think it's going to be a pretty flat year for the, if we're talking about GDP, uh, real GDP, I think this year is going to be close to flat. Look, the Fed itself, the Fed laid its cards on the table. It told us in its last uh, set of projections that uh, it's expecting real GDP to be one plus 1.4% this year. And actually, when you look historically, half the time when you have 1.4% growth in a given year, uh, you had a recession sometime in that year, but they don't tell you the quarterly pattern. So my view is not actually that much different than than the Fed uh, in terms of where the economy is going. I could pro- I'm probably uh, weaker than their forecast is, but just consider what the Fed's telling you about the economy, plus 1.4 uh, for this year on real GDP. Um, that's uh, substantially weaker than plus 3% last year. Hey there, I hope that you are enjoying this interview. If you can, please take a moment to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the notification bell. This will keep you up to date with all of our new interviews, and it will also help us grow this channel and continue to bring some amazing guests. Thank you so much for your support, and enjoy the rest of the interview. Um, Before I ask you on the Fed, I'm glad you brought up um, autos and and credit cards and buy now, pay later. I was going to ask you about that too, because I also wonder, Dave, like um, the the folks who are having the delinquencies on autos and credit cards, I, I kind of wonder if it's more of like my generation, millennials, maybe younger. I don't know if there's any generational data, but you know, maybe the generations that aren't really homeowners too. I always wonder about that because I don't, I know the percentage of millennials that own homes, it's definitely not as high as the boomers or gen, I believe gen X maybe, but I do wonder. I don't know if there's even data on that. Yeah, but the, who's the, yeah, the, the, the New York Fed has uh, age data. And I think you're probably right. I think that is geared towards um, uh, the younger age cohorts. Uh, but then yeah. again, they're the ones that spend most of their income. So that, they're not an inconsequential true. part of the economy. Uh, but that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very fair point. Yeah. And then, um, so speaking of the Fed, um, I know we, well, we had the January FOMC a lot of folks who are expecting rate cuts. Um, some were expecting six this year. Um, looks like there won't be any in March. Um, wh- what's your outlook for when it comes to um, the rate policy for the Federal Reserve? Well, look, the, the timing is very difficult, and especially for this Fed, which is so consumed with the, its credibility, especially after 
uh, missing on transitory, 9% inflation. You have uh, poor Jay Powell uh, being compared to Arthur Burns. Um, this constant memory of, are we going back to the 1970s? Uh, you know, the Fed is very nervous about cutting rates prematurely and then having to raise them again. Uh, they're very concerned that if they cut interest rates, we'll have a phenomenon like we had in the 70s where they cut rates and inflation comes back and then they're, and then we get these, you know, we had three recessions uh, from 1970 to 1980, uh, just these ongoing boom-bust cycles. Uh, they want to avoid that. So I think that uh, at this stage, unless we get a financial accident, they've already said, that uh, even with the unemployment rate of 4.1%, which is their forecast, and with 1.4% real growth for this year, which I think is reasonable, they're going to cut rates three times. Uh, I think the market, you know, I think it was something that Mary Daly said from the San Francisco Fed in, in December about March, um, just a, a, veiled, a veiled reference, and, 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 and the investors just jumped all over that, and all of a sudden, you know, we're priced for March. Uh, I, I would be classified as a Fed dove if I was uh, on the FOMC. Uh, I'm a renowned uh, bond bull. But even I was thinking that was a little bit nutty because not enough information was going to come out by March for the Fed to start embarking on that um, first rate cut. And the Fed knows that the markets are so sensitive. I mean, to even a, a change in a adverb, an adjective, uh, a pronoun, you know, in the and the Fed press statements elicits this outsized response. I, I mean, the, the Fed's always mattered for the markets, but it's sort of uh, several standard deviation, uh, s- several SD SDs away from uh, from what the norm has been. So I think the Fed's very sensitive to that as well because they know that when they make that first cut, it, it's going to be a big deal, and they are always concerned that the markets will over extrapolate what they're going to do. At case in point, and that's why they were dovish in December, uh, and then all of a sudden they switched to being far less dovish when they saw how the markets had leapfrogged them in terms of uh, you know cutting rates six times. Now the market's gone down towards pricing in barely four uh, rate cuts for this year. Um, look, I always said that I am an economic and financial historian, and I play the odds. Me because you know my dad took me to the horse races when I was a kid and I could see that okay what's what, what do we have to know we have to know the track have to know the jockey have to know the horse have to know the uh, the weather conditions and we're always playing the odds always understanding that there's shades of gray you know you're just building a base case scenario but it's not the only case scenario you have to have a plan B but you don't have to tell people you know what your base case scenario is so I was saying well look what's the historical norm here it is okay said um after, you know, the last time they tightened was last July. And then they skipped a couple of meetings and I said, okay, okay, if they skipped the December meeting, which they did, and remember they were still talking about an extra rate hike, which then they removed. Uh, I was saying if they don't do anything in December, uh, then the cycle is done. The rate cycle is done because I know historically once they go five months on the sidelines after a rate hiking cycle, it's over. Uh, so that's a nice piece of information to have, that the rate cycle is over. And then the qu- next question is, well, when do they start cutting rates? Because every end of a tightening cycle was followed by an easing cycle. So what was the norm? What's the norm? What's the norm lag? If the norm lag is five months uh, from last rate hike uh, to going staying on hold, that, that is a signal that the cycle is over. What's the lag to the first rate cut? And I was saying, well, typically the Fed doesn't cut rates right away, you know, unless you got a stock market collapse on your hands, like we had, for example, back in uh, October of 1987, which, by the way, is when I started in the business. The lag from the last rate hike to the first rate cut is 10 months. But where does that put you on the calendar? Puts you in May. So I have been sort of May, June. I remain in May, June. Um, can the Fed just uh, lag behind and just cut rates three times this year? You know, that's certainly plausible. They're, uh, you, they want to be very comfortable that underlying inflation is moving towards their target. They said that they're not going to necessarily wait to get to 2%, but they want evidence that that is a clear path that we're getting towards. The question becomes, I think, less one of timing. Uh, there's no economist I know that's, that, that, get, that gets the timing right consistently. Um, 
to me, what's more important is the destination. What is the destination? So you got to remember that despite all the debate over where, quotes, our star is, where is the equilibrium or neutral nominal funds rate, the Fed hasn't wavered. They're still publishing 2.5%. That, by the way, is a number here at Rosenberg Research. We've done many reports on our star. That, that's where we followed as well. So just to eradicate uh, the excess restraint in the system, they got to go to 2.5%. They got to go from basically five and a quarter, five and a half down to two and a half. They got to cut rates 300 basis points. That's how tight policy is. Just to get to neutral, you got to go to two and a half. If we get a recession, which I think we will, then history shows they cut rates 500 basis points. Now, the Fed is telling you that uh, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, however, the Fed doesn't really have a recession in its forecast. If we get a hard landing, which is what a recession is, um, history shows that they cut rates 500 basis points, which takes us back close to the zero bound. So pick your poison. We're either going back down towards the zero bound in a um, in a recession environment, or they've got to eliminate the excessive restraint in a, even a, in a prolonged soft landing environment that takes inflation down towards 2%, and that leaves the funds rate at 2.5%. So that's where I think the destination is going to be. Call it anywhere from 0.5 on the funds rate to 2.5. That's the destination. How long it takes to get there, that I have less visibility on. But I know the destination, and I know what the yield curve will probably look like when we get to that point. What do you think it'll look like? Well, I think that you're probably going to have um, the uh, the 10-year note down to around 3% if not lower and the long bond down to about 3.5% if, if not lower. And, uh, you know, the convexity is so powerful. Uh, you have so much coupon protection now, which you didn't have a couple of years ago, obviously. It didn't take much to generate those uh, couple of years of negative returns in the treasury market because you had no coupon protection and then yields went up. And when yields go up, long duration bonds get whacked. However, we're at a different point in the cycle right now. Back then, the Fed was just starting raising rates. Uh, the market was adjusting. Now it's just a question of when the Fed starts cutting and by how much. So we get a hundred basis point decline in uh, bond yields. Uh, and and you know the thing is that I find most equity people don't know bond market math. The convexity you're not you're not buying bonds to hold on for the next thirty years. I mean, unless you're an insurance company or you're doing asset liability matching, you're buying bonds to make money and. Treasuries are the most liquid asset class that there is. Um, you're not buying bonds for the yield, you're buying them for the capital gain. And if I'm right on the rates forecast and how the yield curve is going to evolve over the next year, I think you'll make more than 20% total return in the 30-year treasury bond. And most of that return will come from the price appreciation. Okay, this is interesting to me, um, and I, maybe we can go over a little bit of the bond math, and it's okay if it gets a little wonky. I love listening to you and learning from you. 20% total return. Can you walk us through that thesis and the path there? Yeah, well, it's just uh, it's it's the coupon that you're going to get in the long bond. Call it whatever it is right now, 4.5%. But you see, it's the, the fact that the longer duration the bond is, the greater the, the price sensitivity as yields go down. So you're buying it for the capital gain. People don't understand that you're not buying bonds to clip some coupon. You're buying bonds like you're buying any other asset for the price appreciation. So in this forecast, basically over 80% of the total return is going to come from the price appreciation. As the yields go down, prices rise. And they do it more forcefully the longer duration the instrument that you're owning. Got it. Okay. Um, and then with um, the Fed cutting rates, what what would that do to equity markets? I am curious because, like, it I I do look at the markets now, and I know it's it's a very few names driving it. Um, and what are they signaling, or what are they pricing in, or maybe it's just a divergence. But what happened? What do you think happens to equity markets in the rate cut? Um, well, cycle. the historical record is that if the Fed cuts rates into a non-recessionary environment, uh, stock market will do just fine. Examples, 2019. Remember the Fed cut rates three times, no recession. Uh, and people talk about 
oh, well, but we had that uh, freeze up in the corporate bond market. But that happened uh-huh. in late uh, 2018. They didn't start to cut rates until we were in August 2019, uh, like nine months later. And they did it because they realized inflation had come down significantly and that policy was too tight. So before COVID, they cut rates three times. Stock market did great. Um, you know, the Fed cut rates. When else? They uh, cut rates in, um, uh, I mean, the famous, oh, well, uh, 1998 around long term capital. Greenspan cut rates. Of course, we had a financial situation, long term capital, the tail end of uh, the Asian crisis, the Russian debt default. However, the US economy did just fine. The Fed cut rates and, uh, and uh, 1998. Nine great year. Uh, you go back to when Alan Greenspan developed the moniker the Maestro, uh, and uh, after they tightened, they doubled the funds rate in ninety four and ninety five from three to six percent. They starts cutting rates in the summer of ninety five, cuts rates three times, and ninety five ninety six great years for the stock market. Um, you know, you go back to the nineteen eighty seven stock market collapse. Again, the economy was the full employment uh, GDP growth was running at the uh, Five percent, and they cut rates to protect the stock market. No recession, and then 1988. They're still cutting into the winter of 1988. Stock market does just fine. So you see, it comes down to why is the Fed cutting rates? So the Fed is cutting rates because they feel policy is too restrictive, and that uh, they've overshot, and they want to correct that. Uh, and they're comfortable that inflation is coming down, and they want to cut interest rates so we don't get a recession. The stock market should uh, should be fine. Uh, when the stock market does not do fine is when the Fed raises rates and creates the conditions for an economic recession because you then get an earnings decline and then you get on top of that multiple contraction because of uh, all the uncertainty and that's a double whammy. And that's why in recessionary episodes, the stock market peak to trough is down 30%. You get earnings going down and you get the multiple compression. So it comes down really less about the Fed and more about, which we still don't know the answer to, did the Fed overshoot? The reason why I say the Fed is overshot, again, is because I play the odds. And and what good is history if you're not going to learn from it? Uh, and so we know that historically uh, we've had in the post-World War II experience 14 Fed rate hiking cycles. And I remember this one. This one was the most pernicious since 1981. 14 Fed rate hiking cycles. And 11 times they were followed by a recession. 11. So you'll say, okay, well, three didn't get followed by a recession. And maybe this will be one of those. And it's true. We had a period where the Fed tightened uh, in the mid-60s, no recession. Uh, Fed tightened, and yet no recession in the mid-80s. Then, then I said before, the Fed tightened aggressively under Greenspan. No recession in the mid-1990s. But what made those three non-recessionary cycles that followed a aggressive Fed tightening, what made them special or different than today, is because those Feds, those Federal Reserves, stopped tightening once the yield curve flattened. But this Fed, so consumed with this loss of credibility and the inflation bulge, uh, that it kept tightening long after the yield curve had inverted. And the yield curve is the bond market's way of telling the Fed, you've gone way too far. In those three times where we had a Fed tightening cycle and no recession, the Fed respected the yield curve. This Fed has basically dismissed the yield curve, well, pretty well so has everybody else because this recession hasn't happened yet. But 100% of the time in the past, not 80, not 90, not 99, 100% of the time in the past, a Fed tightening cycle that transcends the point at which the yield curve inverts has caused an economic recession. Whether that's three months out, six months out, 12 or 18 months out, the lags, as they say, are long and variable. However, yeah. the track record in Fed-induced inversions of the yield curve has a 100% track record. So why on earth would I ever bet against that? Yeah, it's eight for eight. 
And I think the average was 15. I had um, Cam right. Harvey, Professor Cam Harvey on um, just a few episodes ago. So, yeah. Misery loves company. So far. <laughs> Um, you, you guys should do a webcast sometime if you haven't, um, cause I know you have a great webcast. We'll give each other a bear hug. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay. So when I heard you at the top saying you're bullish on bonds, that's, is that also just relative to stocks as well? Or what are, what are some of the implications mm. too, um, with the, the, the thesis on bonds? Cause if maybe that sounds like an attractive place, could that have implications on the equity markets where maybe folks move more into bonds? Well, it'll, so what will happen at some point is that uh, the relationship between bonds and stocks will move in a way that the stock market will become much more appealing than it is today. And again, it's just pure math. Um, I mean, look, we've got a situation now. I mean, this is not, I mean, what's interesting is that the stock market's been booming this year, even though earnings estimates are coming down. People don't realize that. Beginning of the year, the consensus was $243 on EPS for this year. It's down about $241. Stock market's going up. It's really a momentum-based rally. There is so much psychology involved in the stock market. More than any other market, I'd say, except maybe crypto or you know Bitcoin. Uh, never, you know, for example, uh, the, term, the term FOMO, the term FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Have you ever heard a bond guy talk about FOMO? You have to fear of missing out on treasuries? Seriously? No. Oh, I don't or think Tina. So. Tina, Tina, yeah. There's no alternative. There's no alternative. Yeah, <laughs> all these acronyms come out of stock market promoters because stocks are sexy and bonds are boring. Or YOLO. But you, you know, the, uh, the, but the math, see, the, the, the math just does not work. Uh, for the stock market, but the stock market is like, it's like an auction, right? And everybody is bidding on, it's like you're, you're at Christie's and you're bidding on, you know, uh, Claude Monet's uh, water lilies and you're watching it go 80 million, 85, 95, do I hear 105? It's basically, it's a, the, the stock market's become a, a bidding war. But you know, at any point in time, there's a multiple of things that drive uh, equity prices. There's the valuations, there is the fundamentals, uh, there is momentum, uh, there are technicals, there's market positioning, um, and a ton of emotion, a ton of emotion. And you get price momentum chasers coming into the market, especially when you have the S&P hit new highs of 5,000, NASDAQ 16,000, nice round numbers. However, what are you paying for? Uh, now, I just tell people what I'm doing uh, and... Um, Everybody else can do what they want to do. I'm just saying the math is not compelling. And when I say math, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the equity risk premium. I'm talking about comparing the valuations of bonds relative to, to stocks. So we have we have the um, the S and P 500 right now is trading at a forward multiple, forward multiple with all those lofty earnings estimates. Although they've come down, we're still looking at almost double digit, digit growth for corporate earnings this year. I mean, where that's going to come from? Uh, it will be interesting to see where we're going to have to have like profits rise at about a three multiple to nominal GDP growth. That'll be interesting to see how that comes out. But we've got a 4.8%, 4.8% earnings yield on the S&P 500. That is the yield. So I was saying, what are you paying for? Look at what you're paying for. 4.8% yield. How does that compare to say, you know, forget bonds, 5.4% three month treasury bill yield and treasury bills, treasury bills, have no duration risk and they have no capital risk and you're getting paid 60 basis points more in T-bills compared to where equities are priced today. Now we go to the 10-year treasury note and the equity risk premium is down to like, you know, 70, 80 basis points. What is the historical norm? The ERP, the ERP is a mean reverting series. So I will go back to my hero and mentor, Bob Farrell's rule number one, that ratios, market ratios tend to revert to the mean over time. But the equity risk premium historically is between three to four to basis points. It's between 70 and 80 basis points right now. You are just, you know, the way I see it and people are jumping into the equity market and so many people just don't agree with me because they're just seeing my call and they're seeing what the market's actually doing. And I'm saying it doesn't matter. You are chasing this market and you are paying to take on equity risk instead of getting paid take on equity risk. 
but nobody's paying attention to risk. You look at a VIX of like 12. I mean, they're saying, you know, insurance, downside protection is so cheap, buy it. You know, if you fall in love with your equity portfolio, don't part with it. Just hedge it. Um, but again, you know, the thing is that it's just human nature that uh, people just tend to extrapolate. Uh, but that's from talking about the bond market math. And we come back to why I'm bullish on bonds. It comes back again to Bob Farrell's rule number one on mean reversion. I'm looking at all these crazy things, two to three standard deviation events, like the equity risk premium. Uh, you know, how is that going to normalize? How, how will that normalize? It will normalize. It was, if you believe that the S&P 500 is fairly valued today, I got news for you. I got news for you to equilibrate the equity risk premium, to bring it back to its historical norm. If you believe the equity market's fairly priced right now, then to make the math work, the 10-year note's got to plunge below 2% to make that math work. I look at the homeowner affordability ratio. And again, another three standard deviation event. Uh, it is... 25% more stretch than it's been in the past. Ha that is a mean reverting series. How will it mean revert? Well, there's three variables you have to consider. There's household income growth, there's home prices, and there's interest rates. So unless we get significant help from lower home prices, or somehow we get income growth accelerating, which will be sort of difficult because we know the Fed wants the unemployment rate to go above 4%, then it's interest rates that will have to do the heavy lifting to equilibrate or normalize the homeowner affordability ratio. Well, that that takes you down at least 200 basis points on the 10-year note to get to the mortgage rate that's going to facilitate that. And then you got to take a look at what does the yield curve look like? The yield curve has been inverted. The yield curve is only inverted 50, it, only 15% of the time is the yield curve inverted. And all you have to do is take a level one CFA course to learn about the time value of money. It, it does not make sense, nor is it logical to think that the yield curve will stay inverted to perpetuity. It's only inverted because the market is telling the Fed, you got too far and you're staying too tight. So the yield curve itself, this is not a normal yield curve. The yield curve will mean revert. Will it mean revert, which I mean swing from an inversion to a positive slope, will it happen through the back end of the curve that I'm wrong, that bond yields will go up? Well, I guess if we get some exogenous inflationary shock that is persistent, I guess that'll happen. I put low odds on that. I won't put zero odds on it because I don't put zero odds on anything. But more than likely, we're going to go into a classic Fed easing cycle. Interest rates are cyclical and interest rates will come down. Now, what that means to pivot the yield curve to a more normal shape, short-term rates will come down faster than long-term rates, to which you'll say, but I thought you said that the long bond is going to be where to be. That much is true. But you're not going to make much money in the two-year note because there's not much duration there. You're not going to get, you know, there's the convexity trade to generate the total return. So the yield curve will shift down. It will pivot. It will turn more positively sloped because that is part of my whole theme for 2024 well, two themes. One is um, that we will be able to uh, address, redress the anomalies that are out there, which we talked about at the beginning of the show, uh, but that also we're going to have a year of mean reversion. Equity risk premium, homeowner affordability, and the yield curve will be revert to a more normal shape. All roads lead to lower bond yields. Question is, how much? I don't think I'm crazy by saying that especially because we've already seen the longer end of the curve come down almost 100 basis points. And I say that with the recent backup we've had. Another 100 basis points down will yeah. generate a 20% total return in the long bond. And I say that um, this will be the year where bonds have more fun. Yeah. Well, I would love to see um, home affordability um come back a bit as a millennial who would like to own a home. Um, before I let you go, Dave, I was hearing you talk about Bob Farrell, and I know you're a disciple of his. And the influ Can you talk about the influence he's had on you and in, in your career and, and just share more about Bob? Sure. Well, you know, Bob Farrell, uh, and I, I recommend everybody on the show, uh, Google Bob Farrell, Bob Farrell's uh, Ted Marker Rules to Remember, and you'll be inundated. Uh with people who have written uh, theses uh, on his 10 market rules. But Bob was, um, for probably 50 years, was the chief uh, market strategist uh, for Merrill Lynch. 
uh, and starting back like in the 50s. He was, he was a pioneer of technical analysis. Uh, but what made him special was that he wasn't just a chartist. He was also a very deep thinker. And uh, he attached um, a lot of his own um, macro commentary and the way he saw the world in those technical analysis. He was also the first one to invoke sentiment. Sentiment. Uh, maddening crowds, right? Uh, their herd mentality. When to identify when everything is priced in. That's why one of his market rules is that uh, when all the uh, experts and forecasts uh, are moving in, uh, are, are saying the same thing, uh, something else is going to happen. So he attached uh, sentiment and contrary thinking, which was, you know, revolutionary at the time. And we're talking about, we're going back 70 years here. Uh, and uh, towards his later years uh, at Merrill, he produced the finest pieces of research. It was called a theme and profile investing. And again, it was classic Bob Farrell of, uh, of really combining big picture thought towards, you know, charting the markets and looking at overbought, oversold and all the ABC waves and Fibonacci retracements, but he was much bigger than that. So yeah, he had a profound impact uh, on my career. I was following him long before I joined Merrill. And then when I joined Merrill uh, at, at the beginning of 2000, uh, you know, we struck up a, a great relationship. And of course, I sought him out uh, as a mentor. Um, and uh, I'm an economist who always relished uh, taking the economic data points and uh, connecting the dots towards the markets to formulate a cogent and coherent investment thesis for my clients. I've always done that. I'm always learning. Uh, I'm always refining. And, and Bob, in his own way, in a different craft, did the same sort of thing. Um, you know, he was, uh, he did not, you know, a lot of technical people, um, strategists and the like, they, 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 they don't really look so much at the macro. Bob did look at the macro. Um, but, uh, you know, besides the fact that he was just a, a true gentleman and a, and a professional and uh, an excellent demeanor uh, and very generous with his time, and he was a, a superb teacher. Uh, but yeah, he, um, you know, he, I, I, you know, I sought him out, and um, and uh, I actually had a publication that I developed when I was at Merrill Lynch Canada uh, that was very much mirroring uh, the shorter work that he was doing. But yeah, he was a he was a pioneer in uh, in market strategy. But his uh, greatest contribution probably was adding on to those layers of technical analysis the importance of uh, the, the importance of uh, sentiment. And he gave me the courage. He gave me the courage uh, to think as a contrarian at all times and to be aware of where the herd mentality is which is exactly what I'm looking, staring at in the face right now. And I love that so much. And Dave, you've taught us so much in this hour, and I'm so grateful for you being so generous with your time. I want to give you the last few minutes to let folks know where they can, um, you know, find your work, um, maybe share where you're all, you are on social media. And also, um, any parting thoughts for the folks watching and listening, um, please take the next few minutes to do so. Right. Well, look, you can um, just Google Rosenberg Research. Uh, you know, we have our, I, I don't know all the all the handles. Um, my, my son, Jacob, who uh, doubles as my COO, has, has all that. Uh, I'm a, well, I know your I'm Twitter. A, I'm a, I'm a social e -E media. Guy Rosie. I'm a, I'm a, my, my, my kids always call me a, a techno peasant. So, uh, um, but I, I have, a, I, we have a YouTube channel and uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, so, you know, I, I send off the stuff and somebody else, you know, post it for me because, uh, you know, I, I still drive a horse and buggy, you know, I, uh, I, I, up until a couple of years ago, I still had a Blackberry. So, uh, so, uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. I would just say if you Google Rosenberg research or you go to information at rosenbergresearch.com, uh, you know, you'll, you'll find me, uh, the website will be right there in front of you. And in fact, um, we'd be happy to offer everybody on this call, a free one month trial of everything that we do. Uh, so you can uh, kick our tires and, um, uh, that's about, you know, how you can find me and how you can find the firm. 
Uh, in terms of just parting uh, thoughts, I would just say, you know, what I've learned after being in this business for uh, almost 40 years is there is no such thing as a sure thing. Uh, and so every forecast I have is a base case, but I have a plan B. I have an answer to the question, Rosie, if you're wrong, where are you going to be wrong? And I know this is going to surprise a lot of people, but I have been wrong in the past. Uh, key is don't hang on to a bad forecast for too long, okay? Uh, but if you don't have a plan B, you don't have a plan. So that's all part and parcel of the first point, which is that uh, there is no such thing as a sure thing. And I would say for the investors out there, do not put all your eggs in one basket. Diversification never goes out of style. By the way, by the way, neither does capital preservation. And you'll find that uh, in my work, you'll find that what I do, I, I'm like a, uh, I identify tail risks and that's very important. There are some economist strategists out there that you want to read because they will tell you to step on the gas at all times. I'm sort of like uh, your brake lights or maybe your left right hand turn indicator. And you need to have those. You need to you need you need to have those. There's there's only a few of us left on Wall Street. So look, I hope you sign on. I uh, hope you come onto the website and uh, get on the one month free trial, and uh, fasten your seatbelt. I love it. Well, David Rosenberg, founder and president of Rosenberg Research. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to have you on the show. Really appreciate you. Thank you, Julia. It's great to be on.